Uh, good afternoon and uh, welcome to today's Maniac Talks. I think uh, as people find their way to H114, uh, I think I'll, I'll start by uh, telling you a, a story as we wait for others to, to come in. So, because Neil is, is a mountaineer, he likes to climb mountains, I, I thought I should find something that relates to his, his passion. Uh, and I was actually pleased today that, uh, you know, the mountain I'm going to talk about, he has already climbed it, so it's, it's kind of it was a pleasant surprise. When I was uh, in grade school, they taught us that the, the highest mountain in Kenya was Mount Kenya. Okay. But this is, you have to imagine, this is a mountain which is located in the same region where I was born. But when you go to school, uh, we had to learn these, these parts. And of course, during exam time, they would ask us questions, you know, for example, Dutch is the highest mountain in Kenya. And believe it or not, some kids would fail. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, not that they were dumb, <laughs> it's because, you know, this thing called mount. What is mounting in their own lo local language, you know? So that language barrier thing was, 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 was one of the problems. But nevertheless, uh, for, for some of us, we have to make sure that you climb it so that when the exam comes and they ask you what is the highest mountain in Kenya or the second high, highest mountain in Africa, then you can actually just write there Mount Kenya and you get it. You know? <laughs> so it was sort of interesting. Anyway, so this mountain assumed a different meaning when I was in graduate school. In graduate school, I realized that I could use it as a platform. Uh, for monitoring long lived transport of, of pollutants. So I set up an experiment all the way at 4.4 uh, kilometers. The mountain itself is about 5 kilometers or so. So I set up you know, a, a, a site, uh, a monitoring station at uh, 4.4 kilometers, and I would sample there continuously throughout the day and night, throughout the month, and I did this for three years. And so you can imagine every month I had to go up you know, change the samples, you know, and then go back. You know, it's quite a lot of work anyway. But I think, I do believe that's when I became a scientist. That was my door to becoming so curious about how the, the atmosphere, the environment works. And we did very interesting work. We established the, the source regions of pollutants, for example, South Africa. We could pick the signature of South Africa in our samples, which was very interesting, you know. So today's speaker, obviously, like I said, he has, you know, been to Mount Kenya before. But in his early years, uh, he used to accompany his father to Mount Paloma, because his father is a famed, is a famed astronomer, you know, who was known for hunting for, for, for asteroids, I, I do believe. Uh, and, but he was, when he was young, he would go accompany his father uh, to the mountain, and it, of course, as he said in the abstract, he messed up some of the photographic plates. <laughs> I do believe that's when his curiosity started. So today, he's going to talk about that journey and his long career he had got at over over that is something years. So he's well, well, uh, you know, acknowledged and accomplished uh, in astronomy, and of course, he and John Martha are the only ones who are members of the the National, Science, uh, National Academy of Sciences. And uh, I believe also you are also a member of the Academy of Arts and, and Sciences. So he's, he's well accomplished, well acknowledged worldwide. And of course, we cannot have a better speaker uh, for this series like th th than Neil Gerrard. So please help me welcome our speaker, Neil Gerrard. Well, I'm very pleased to be here today. It's a lot of fun preparing for a maniac talk. You get to uh, ask your mother for pictures and uh, think, you know, old friends. So I, I did some of that. I'll, I'll, I wasn't planning to talk about Mount Kenya, but I'll start out talking about it. I didn't bring my, actually they're just pictures from those days. I don't have them on my computer. But I actually climbed Mount Kenya as a part of official NASA duty. <laughs> the SWIFT mission has a ground station on the equator that was contributed by the Italian Space Agency. It's in Malindi. It's in Kenya. Um, and so in 2006, after the Swiss, uh, SWIFT launch, we went to Kenya to visit the Malindi ground station, and we gave them a talk, and we talked about technical interfaces. And it was a great trip. 
But the uh, president of the Italian Space Agency uh, is a mountain climber. And so he invited uh, a couple of us uh, to go with him to climb Mount Kenya. So I, I consider that official duty. We talked about business some of the time. <laughs> and um, it's actually a, not that easy a mountain to climb because uh, as you're getting up to the, you know, above 14,000 feet, uh, it becomes a rock climb. And we had a local guide come with us to, you know, run the ropes. And uh, it, was, it was really fun. Uh, it took about, took three days. So, um, so I'll be talking today about uh, sort of my life and career. Now, I actually have a fairly simple uh, life track um, because I, I grew up in, t I, I moved around with my father to various postdocs, but we ended up in Tucson, Arizona, and, uh, and I grew up there pretty much. And I also went to the University of Arizona. Then I did go somewhere else, you know, to Pasadena, to Caltech for grad school. And I came here to Goddard in 1981 as a postdoc, and I've been here ever since. So uh, it's a glorious place to work. I'm really pleased to be here. So that's my mother, Elena de Stoppelar, and my father, Anton Gerls, known in the US as Tom. And they're both Dutch. And they came over, from, they married in Holland and came over in 1951. I was born in 1952. And when they got on the uh, boat to come over, my father said to my mother, from now on, we're going to speak English to each other. And she said, what? <laughs> And they never spoke Dutch to each other after that. And so uh, I grew up in an English-speaking uh, family. But um, he had a fairly strong Dutch accent. And it always really bothered him to have this accent. And wherever he went, people would say, where are you from? And he'd say, you know, El Paso or something ridiculous <laughs> like that. Um, but he was never able to get rid of that accent. And of course, he, looking back, he should have looked at it in the other way and said, I'm from Holland. And, that wasn't his style. <laughs> um, I'll tell you a little bit about the various places that we went uh, you know, as, with him as an astronomer. Um, but then uh, I ended up at the University of Arizona. And the person who really turned me on to physics was uh, Charlie Fan in the physics department. He was a, uh, he's passed away now, but he was a cosmic ray astrophysicist. And he flew instruments on satellites and balloons. And I was able to, to work in his lab actually for four years. And it was a great place. We did, you know, I did soldering, I did programming, uh, I did data analysis. I actually, you know, wrote a couple of papers, gave talks at conferences, and so it was a wonderful start to, to science. And I think it was because of that that I got into, you know, a number of graduate schools, and I was able to to go to Caltech. And I went to Caltech, and uh, if you're a physicist, uh, I don't know. I know there's a number of physicists in the room. At least in the early days, for me, I wanted to be a theorist. You know, the famous physicists are Einstein, Hawking, uh, you know, Feynman. And so I'm going to be a theorist. Well, as I went to school at Caltech, I got other interests. And I ended up actually going into the Cosmic Ray group, you know, who are co very good co colleagues with Charlie Fan. And, uh, and that's where I became a real experimental physicist, which I've remained till today. Um, I started with Robbie Vogt, and then eventually I actually got my degree with Ed Stone. Uh, Robbie became the provost. And we were uh, working on the Voyager instrument, and I'll show you a few slides about that. Uh, it was a really exciting time when Voyager was flying by the different planets. And I met my wife at Caltech. She's, she's a chemist, a physical chemist. She actually came to work in the physics department here at Maryland. Ellen Williams, and uh, we got married at Caltech, and then we came together, largely arranged by uh, Frank McDonald, who was a, also a Cosmic Ray guy, collaborating with the Cosmic Ray group there. And I got to know him very well through the Voyager encounters, and uh, so I came here. There was a pretty good pathway for people coming from uh, Caltech to, to Goddard. Frank Marshall was another person that uh, came through that path. And I was a postdoc with Bonner Teagarden um, as an NPP. Uh, that was only for a year and a half. In those days, there was a fairly steady stream through NPP into the civil service, which has gotten totally clogged up right now, because I, I know we're trying to, I'm a, I'm a branch head over in, uh, in the Astrophysics Science Division. It's really hard to get hires these days. I also want to mention Nick White, who is 
really important in helping uh, enable the SWIFT mission and just a very close colleague and, and mentor of mine. All these people are my mentors. Uh, more recently, I've sort of, I, I looked to the, my friends in the universities and just in the whole community as sort of my mentor pool. Uh, Netta Bacall, David Spurgle, and many other people. I didn't put them on, on here. And, uh, and finally, here is a mountain picture. I'm uh, with Nani Binyami on the top of Tupongato, which is a 24,000 foot peak. It's a little bit shy of Aconcagua in the Andes. But it was a remarkable trip because um, that mountain was closed. It was a military. It was right on the border with Argentina. And they were at war even at times. And he befriended the commandant of the Chilean military post that included that mountain. And so we actually got taken to the base camp on the military mules. And then some of the soldiers climbed with us. And it was, you know, we were the first ones to climb it in about 15 years. That was a, a great trip. OK, so let me sort of go back and, and say a few things about the early days. I was always embarrassed that my name was Cornelius Adolf Gerals. And so when I was young, I just went by Neil. I, I didn't even know how to spell Cornelius for, for a long time. And Adolf, ugh. Um, <laughs> you know, but I came by it honestly. Um, this is my uncle, Cornelius Adolf Gerals, uh, also Dutch. Here's my, the Dutch family on the ice. This is a painting that my son did in high school. And uh, Dutch, the, uh, Holland was invaded by the Germans in World War II, and it was really a bad time, especially uh, getting to the winter of 1945. Uh, it was a really cold winter. Many people died. Uh, my father got out and fought with the Allies. He was a paratrooper. He paratrooped back into, uh, into Holland. But Cornelis Gerrels um, ran a radio station and also had a Jewish family in his basement. And he wasn't very careful. And so he got caught and he died in a concentration camp. So my father named me after him. And my mother lived through the whole war. And uh, I mean, it was pretty horrific. Uh, you know, they were eating tulip bulbs. And, 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 and that, it was a young time in her development. So it, it, wasn't, it wasn't good at all. They were both in the Calvinist church. They were both sort of Lutheran church. But they were of different sects. You think, uh, you know, being a Dutch Reformed Church or Lutheran would mean they'd be fairly close. But of course, the closer you are in religion, the further away you are. And so those two really religions are really at war in Holland. And neither of their families, except for my mother's mother, came to their wedding. It was just so horrendous that they would be marrying each other. Uh, but they got married. and. Uh, Following a, a long history of uh, other Dutch astronomers, my dad wanted to come to the US where there are better telescopes and better universities. I mean, Leiden and has a, they're great astronomers in Holland, too. But uh, Bach and Kuiper, and, and he came too. And he hitchhiked across the US wanting to get to Palomar, uh, which he finally did. And uh, here's an early shot from our family from those days. So here's a, I'll tell you the story about the plates. First of all, we, uh, he would often observe on McDon at McDonald Observatory, which is on a mountain in Texas near Fort Davis. And at that time, there was the biggest telescope there, which was a really big telescope, was uh, 82 inch, which is uh, 2.1 meters. It's not very big by today's standards. But uh, here I am on the Van Beesbrook Trail in, in uh, my dad's neck. And uh, as I got older, I became his kind of night assistant. Uh, not all the time, of course, especially when we went to the big telescopes at 200 inch at Palomar. They had professional people there. But I would accompany him uh, many times. And I have the fondest memories of, of those days. I don't have that many fond memories in general about Fort Davis. We lived on that mountain for a year, and it was my first grade year. And so there was two astronomer kids who would go on the bus every day down to the school in Fort Davis. And it wasn't a big school. I think the whole kindergarten through sixth grade was 100 people. But everyone else was a rancher's kid. And you know, rancher's kids don't like astronomer's kids. At least that's the way I remember it. <laughs> um, so you know, I got tough. <laughs> they also had 
serious corporal punishment in the school. If you did anything wrong, the teacher would bring you up to the front of the room with a big paddle in front of everybody. It happened to me. I never told my parents about it. I can't even remember what I did wrong, but it was a psychological burden for me for a long time. Um, then we went to uh, Tucson. I was 14 years old. Uh, I went with him on a run to Palomar Observatory. And he was observing on the 48-inch, the Schmidt telescope. This is the telescope that did the Palomar All-Sky Survey. It's a wide field of view telescope. But it's also very good for asteroid studies. And so he had, he had two nights on it, uh, of which I was assisting him for, for one night. And uh, my job was to go up to the telescope. He would take a plate, and I'd take it down and develop it. And they're big glass plates. about I think they're about 16 inches on a side. And you take it down, you put it in the developer, then the stop, then the fixer, and the rinse. And then you put it on the rack. And so the whole night, you know, and this is a precious night. He only had two that year. Um, you know, all the plates were there, and I was developing. Somehow along the way, I forgot that I was supposed to change the developer every 10 plates. <laughs> and so after about the 20th plate, they were just black. <laughs> And I still remember him coming. Of course, it was his own fault. He should have come down and done a check, but he didn't. He came down and he said, oh. <laughs> never said anything else about it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, it was kind of a traumatic uh, event. It wasn't because of that that I sort of turned away from science, which I was very interested in in, uh, in grade school and junior high school. Uh, but I, for, I was a member of this rock band, and I got really interested in music. And, and I had this idea, um, yeah, you know, the usual rock band pictures. Um, we were pretty successful. We actually toured around Arizona every year and made a reasonable amount of money. Um, but I just decided I didn't want to do the same thing that my dad was doing. So I was trying to go in this other direction. And uh, at the same time, I was also... Uh, interested in traveling. And so I did this uh, bike ride from a little bit south of Tucson down to the Panama Canal. Um, hitchhiked around the world with my brother. That was a really exciting trip in 1973. It was one of the few times that you could actually go through, you know, Iran, Afghanistan, everywhere but Burma, which we had to fly over. Uh, you know, the, the Shah was in Iran. It was a safe place to be. It was an amazing trip. Here we are in a steam engine. We flew on a DC-3. Funeral pyre in India. Um, <coughs> once we got to Istanbul, we realized you can't hitchhike around the world because nobody knows what you're doing. You're standing on this side of the road with your thumb out, and they're looking like, what's? <laughs> so we got on buses and trains, and uh, it, it was a really neat experience. And I wanted to show you. I just stuck this in a minute ago. Uh, I still do like to climb mountains. I mentioned Mount Kenya. And uh, in, 19, in 2007, I went with John Grunsfeld to Aconcagua. And we climbed up the Polish glacier. We actually didn't quite get to the top, but we got close. And so uh, I still like to do that kind of stuff, although it doesn't happen as often as it used to. I was so interested in music that I actually went to the University of Arizona as a music major and eventually finished that degree. But in, I don't remember the date, but there was a date, a particular moment in July 1972, where I realized Music is a great hobby, but it's a lousy profession. <laughs> Just looking how the musicians in the music department lived, and you know, they, they were just practicing all the time, and you were either performing or you had to be writing great pieces. And I had some talent, but I just, it wasn't, didn't feel right. And I realized that the thing I really liked doing was math and, and, and science, and so I decided then to switch over, and I immediately switched to physics, finished the music, but uh, you know, went to work with Charlie Fan, and it was great. Uh, I already mentioned about this theory or experiment that eventually led to astrophysics at, at uh, Caltech. So Caltech was uh, a, a, a great time. I helped uh, calibrate, and we were still building the, no, one of the Voyagers had already launched. The other one hadn't when I got there. And so uh, there was a lot of hardware work to do in the lab. Uh, we built proportional <laughs> counters to take to the accelerator uh, with us. Uh, and so here was the turn on of Voyager 1. 
And that's the way it looked in those days. Everyone was gathered around the printer trying to see if the instrument was working. And uh, I was fortunate enough to, even before we got to Jupiter, it was decided, OK, you're going to write. The idea with Voyager was eventually it would go outside of the heliosphere, which it's just doing now if you've been following the news. But it was much too long a time for a graduate student to actually collect cosmic ray data with the cosmic ray instrument. So I was given the Jupiter encounter data, uh, even before we went by Jupiter. That turned out to be great, because we flew by Jupiter, and this cosmic ray instrument detected the most unusual abundances that you've ever seen with the cosmic ray instrument. Usually you see hydrogen, helium, carbon, sulfur, maybe some iron. Every, all the ions we saw in the magnetosphere were basically dominated by oxygen and sulfur. And during that same flyby, the cameras detected volcanoes on Io, and they were spewing the sulfur dioxide out into the, out in the magnetosphere where the ions would get accelerated. And I wrote a couple of really nice papers with, uh, with Ed. And one of the things we did was we predicted that the aurorae on Jupiter would actually be, are caused by oxygen and sulfur ions that are hitting the, uh, you know, precipitating into the atmosphere. And that was later shown to be the case. So that, that paper still gets a, a, a lot of nice references. Well, the other thing that happened there is I met my wife. We were both living in the dorm. Um, and there were only four graduate women that wanted to live in the dorms. And there were about 80 graduate men. And in those days, they didn't have enough thought or, you know, how, what do you do with that problem? Oh, we'll stick those four women in the men's dorm. <laughs> and so you think, oh, that'd be great for the women. No, it was awful. <laughs> Every woman in this audience realizes that. <laughs> it's like way too much attention. Um, but I realized that th this was a challenge for me. <laughs> So I was immediately attracted to uh, Ellen, and uh, we eventually uh, hooked up, and we got an apartment, got married in Dabney Gardens. And uh, these were the years when the Caltech undergraduates were doing all kinds of pranks. Like they changed the Hollywood sign to say Caltech, and they, uh, <laughs> they somehow got into the card cues at the Rose Bowl. And so suddenly, instead of saying, uh, you know, LA, it said Caltech. <laughs> And everyone said, what did we just spell? <laughs> in the dorm, um, there was a, a rule that we, that us guys, you know, we'd hang out. And we'd, we had this rule, the number one rule, never marry a Caltech woman. <laughs> and so when we got married, this was the nap. Here, I brought one. These were the napkins from our wedding. <laughs> I was violating the, the number one rule. And, of course, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. It's another uh, funny story about Ellen. We both started at the same time. And she was in chemistry. I was in physics. And the chemists all got their degrees in five years. And especially in, in physics, and I don't know how long it took you, Frank, but the typical, OK, seven years. That was the average time in the cosmic ray group. And, uh, and so I was, gonna, I was planning on taking seven years to get my degree, not, not really a problem. But you know, Ellen didn't think that was right. And without telling me, she went and made an appointment and met with Ed Stone. And I don't know what they said, but somehow she talked him into fast tracking me. <laughs> and so I show up. I didn't know anything about this. I show up Monday, and the secretary says, Ed wants to see you. So I, I went in to see Ed. And, you know, and he said, well, you know, I, th I think you should start working on writing your thesis. And I was thinking. What a strange coincidence. Ellen was just talking about that. <laughs> so I, I may still have the record for the fastest degree from the Cosmic Ray Group at uh, Caltech. I got out in five years. And we left at the same time. And we came here to, uh, to Goddard. And it was Frank McDonald and Bob Park at the University of Maryland that sort of worked together to get us two postdoc positions here. And then we very quickly got civil service jobs. And I switched from cosmic rays to, uh, to gamma rays. And Frank switched from cosmic rays to x-rays. 
you know, there, and there's still really great cosmic ray groups. In fact, in my own lab, there's, there's an active cosmic ray group. But I viewed sort of gamma ray astronomy as a, as a frontier, and it excited me because in those days, um, oh, hey, Tom, <laughs> should have brought some of our climbing pictures. Um, in those days, um, gamma ray astronomy was just beginning. It was really in its infancy. And uh, it was you know, exciting to, to, to join a field that was just starting out. Most of the observations were made with high altitude balloons. And it's still true that high altitude balloons make really, can make really specialized and good observations. So we have uh, two active balloon programs in my lab right now, one in cosmic rays and one in uh, focusing hard x-rays. We had a instrument. It was I was there to help design it and build it. Uh, Bonner Teagarden was the principal investigator. And Jack Tuller, who passed away three years ago, uh, took that over when Bonner retired. Um, and this instrument was to perform gamma ray spectroscopy of bright objects in the sky. And it had these seven really large germanium detectors about the size of my fist. I brought a small test one that we had, very massive. The good thing about germanium is it uh, you know, has a high density and high stopping power for gamma rays. You know, also, when you cool it to liquid nitrogen temperatures, it has very high energy resolution. And so people use it. Chemists and physicists use it in the laboratory if they want to do high precision spectroscopy. We wanted to fly one on a balloon. So here's the sodium iodide shield, the detectors. There's cold fingers going down into a liquid nitrogen bath. And uh, just by chance, it, it worked out so well. This instrument was just in its sort of final stages of being developed when supernova 1987A went off. And, uh, Lots of instruments were shipped down to Alice Springs, Australia to observe the supernova. And some of them were in similar uh, condition to ours. They really weren't done yet. But you, you get uh, an instrument built really quickly in the field because you, you, know, you have the engineers, technicians, scientists working 16 hours a day on it. And so we, uh, we finished the GRIS instrument, launched it. We made a really unusual, interesting measurement this is, the, uh, this is a spectrum. You know, if you're not a physicist, it may be a little bit difficult. But everybody here I, is familiar with spectra, of course. This is a, there's, there's a wider, there's a larger width to the line that was expected from predictions. It was expected to be a narrow line. These gamma rays are coming from radioactive material that's produced in the center of the supernova explosion. And it's supposed to, the idea at the time was that it'd be produced in a shell, and it would expand out with the supernova as a shell. And so it would all have the same velocity and would be a very narrow line. What we observed, and there was another instrument that observed the same thing, is that it was significantly broadened. Even this model had some broadening in it, and ours was even broader than the model. And what we had discovered, other people also found this, is that when a supernova explodes, it doesn't come out as neat onion shells, but there's mixing that goes on. And it's now a kind of standardly accepted uh, idea that supernova have mixing uh, that, that happens and produces this broadened line. Uh, Scott Barthelme, who you'll hear more about in, in later parts, uh, you know, played a key role. And there are many other people. I'm only mentioning a few as we go along. We flew another time in 1998, and uh, I was to man the downrange station. So usually you fly when the winds are just turning around and the balloon stays overhead where you launched it for a long period of time, maybe up to 40 hours, a couple days. In this case, we were a little bit post-turnaround, and so the winds had started blowing west. And our idea was to launch the payload there, and then it would come to this telemetry station that we established you know, part near the west coast of, of Australia. Um, and so I was one of the people that I went with one pilot and myself in this two-engine plane uh, flying across the the Gibson Desert. And it looks kind of small on the map, but it, that's a six-hour flight. You know, we had to stop at one place uh, to get fuel. It was actually an aboriginal site, uh, village. And I didn't see a single soul you know, three minutes out of Alice Springs until we landed at this mine site. Uh, and, and this is what it looked like almost the whole way. It was completely deserted. 
ballooning has, uh, you always think about 40 when you think about ballooning. You can fly for about 40 hours, that's a maximum length of time. A really big balloon is 40 million cubic feet, and the altitude that the balloon flies at is 40 kilometers. So it's a kind of convenient way to, uh, to think about that. I was interested, in, or all of us in the group were interested in proposing this germanium spectrometer to fly on a satellite, and we had some unsuccessful proposals, you know, that's part of life. Um, and so we were working on those proposals. Oh, you know, what comes up must come down. <laughs> Wasn't always a pretty sight. GRIS flew nine times and we got data on all nine flights, which is a really good record for a balloon instrument. Uh, even when it would crash like this, you could recover the detectors and rebuild it. But as we were putting in these proposals to fly a germanium instrument, which eventually happened, it's called Integral, the Europeans did this many years later. Uh, Steve Holt came in my office one day and he said, Don Niffen's the project scientist for the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory. It's about to launch this year and he wants to retire. Do you want to be the project scientist? I said, Sure, <laughs> what's it involve? <laughs> so, um, so I became the project scientist just before the launch of CGRO, uh, and Jay Norris was my deputy. And I remember Steve Holt, uh, you know, met with us for the first time, and we were saying, you know, how do you do? What are we supposed to do? And he said, the, the budget was twenty-five million dollars a year, which is a lot of money in those days. It still is. He said. Don't break any laws and make it a fabulous success. <laughs> okay, that's pretty easy. <laughs> so after he left the office, Jay and I are looking at each other like, okay, what are we gonna do? We've got enough money. <laughs> and so our policy was the, there were four instrument teams that were getting most of the money. The ones that were producing the most data, we give more money to. We started giving more money to the guest observers. We built a really robust guest observer program. And then we put money into advertising the mission to the different communities, and astronomical communities and the public. Uh, it was the second great observatory after the Hubble, 17 tons. It was the biggest payload launched by the shuttle. And uh, it really worked out well in the end. I mean, it would have worked out well with, without me there. These instruments were already built. Uh, but I had a lot of fun. There were four big instruments on board, high energy gamma rays, medium, low energy gamma rays, and on the corner were the BATSI modules which were detecting gamma ray bursts. And uh, I'll just show you a couple of results. This was really the first time that the gamma ray sky had been observed in this kind of uh, you know, quality and with all of these different instruments. And so we were discovering what it looked like for the first time. Here were, here were the map of the sources that we saw in the, in the sky. Some of them, a few of them were pulsars. Some of them we discovered were blazars, which are uh, quasars that have jets aimed in our direction. Uh, photons could be accelerated in those jets to very high energies. That wasn't realized. And so I wrote a paper with Chuck Dermer showing that the spectra are very different for blazars and normal Seifert galaxies. And uh, here's kind of our greatest hits uh, slide. The BATSI instrument detected almost 3,000 gamma ray bursts. At that time, we had no idea what caused gamma ray bursts. Were they some local phenomena in the solar system? Were they neutron star flares in the galaxy? Or were they extragalactic? Well, the BATSI instrument showed each dot as a gamma ray burst, and they were spread out uniformly over the sky. There was no hint of a concentration along the galactic plane. So that lended a lot of credence to the idea that they were extragalactic. It didn't prove it, but it was, uh, it was certainly the first indication. And uh, the medium energy gamma ray instrument was looking at radioactivity from the last million years in the galaxy. This is a map of the continuum radiation seen at high energy gamma rays. Um, uh, it's a beautiful map. I'm going to show you at the end of the talk a comparison of these data to the data from the Fermi mission, which we're flying now. And you'll see how even much more beautiful our current data are. Um, and there's an antimatter glow from the galactic center. This is known before GRO flew. But they're positrons that are produced, and they annihilate with electrons. And they make a 511 keV spectral line. And uh, it's concentrated right at the galactic center. So, uh, so CGRO was, was wonderful. Unfortunately, it lost a gyro. Um, in 2000. We still had 
three gyros. We still had enough to fly, but we didn't have a redundant one. If we lost another one, there could be a safety concern of not being able to re-enter it properly. And so it, it hard discussions, and you know, you might call them a fight almost with headquarters about this. Uh, was really, I was fighting with Ed Weiler, uh, and, and, and Goddard Management was, su was supporting us at first. But eventually it was just decided the risk was too high, and in 2000 the observatory, perfectly functioning, was brought down in the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> and uh, I still remember that night. So that led us to the current era, and I'm going to spend the rest of the talk talking about SWIFT and, and Fermi a little bit. And I've gotten to be pretty good friends with Ed Weiler now. He's retired. He's actually going to be here tomorrow uh, for this event at the Air and Space Museum. He's one of the speakers. And he, uh, you know, he very openly will talk, even publicly will say that, you know, with the loss of the Compton Observatory, the other three great observatories were still flying, uh, Spitzer, Chandra, and Hubble. In fact, they still are today. That there really needed to be some replacement capability in the gamma ray band. And so I think, you know, it was, wasn't his plan to make it work that way, but he was inclined to, to accepting uh, our proposal that we put in for SWIFT uh, for a gamma ray burst mission and the, and the larger Fermi mission as kind of follow-ons to CGRO. And so I want to tell you a little bit about SWIFT. Uh, first of all, sort of the story of how it got to launch and then uh, a little bit about the science. So first of all, in 1998, we already had this map from the Batsy instrument and an Italian Dutch satellite called Beppo Sachs discovered for the first time X-ray and optical afterglow from a gamma ray burst. So bursts go off about you know, once a week for Beppo Sachs. If you look over the whole sky, they go off about once a day. They last something like 100 seconds. They're incredibly bright, um, but we had no idea what was causing them. Beppo Sachs got a counterpart in the X-ray band, and it was seen, and this is an HST image um, in the optical band, it's seen that the, uh, that bright fading gamma ray burst is superimposed on a distant galaxy. So that was the first evidence, direct evidence, that they're coming from outside our own galaxy. You can also see how bright it is. When a gamma ray burst first goes off, it, it outshines every other gamma ray source in the sky, but the optical and X-ray emission are also extremely bright outshining the entire galaxy with 100 billion stars. So they're the most luminous <coughs> explosions in the universe. I put together a team in 1998 to propose to the mid-X round, the Explorer round, uh, a mission called SWIFT. And we took advantage of a few things. Nick White had uh, found European collaborators that contributed an X-ray telescope and a UV optical telescope. And for the gamma ray detection instrument, there was a new technology that we found. This was uh, called Kadzing Tell Detectors. They were being used for medical imaging. And uh, they're pretty well developed for brain scans and things like that, but hadn't been flown in space. And so here at Goddard, we entered a huge effort. Scott Bartholomew was the lead scientist for this to make this detector flight qualified. This had already happened before 1998. And just when those discoveries of how interesting gamma ray bursts were, you know, occurred, we had enough, a high enough TRL level on these new type of detectors to be able to propose a SWIFT mission. There's Scott. We called him the Batman because this instrument was the BAT, the Burst Alert Telescope. BAT has 32,000 of these individual Kadzing Tell detectors in this huge uh, array. And uh, it's the most sensitive wide field gamma ray you know, imager, wide field in imager that's ever flown. And the ad idea with SWIFT is that it would detect a gamma ray burst autonomously on board, determine where it came from, and repoint the satellite so the X-ray and UV optical telescope could look at it. So we get a cascade of images, sort of two arc minute precision, then a minute and a half later, five arc seconds, and then down to one arc second with the UV optical telescope. Dan Golden, uh, so we put in a proposal. There were 40 proposals submitted in, 2000, in 1998. And uh, we had a lot of things going in our favor. One was the international contribution. 
Uh, the other thing is that Dan Golden in 1998 went to the AAS meeting and he said, in the next Explorer round, we really need to solve the gamma ray burst mystery. You know, this is before the peer review had met. <laughs> so that was, in, that was helping us. That was also the same talk where he said, the next generation space telescope shouldn't have a four meter mirror. That's too small. We need eight meters. And so JWST now, I think, is six meters. But he really, he liked to push the envelope. Here are these Kedzink tell detectors that we developed here at Goddard. In fact, they brought uh, such a wonderful effort that we had with the engineering group. This is one of our flight modules here. So this is a ray of 128, and the electronics are right beneath it. You can see we took it off on this side so you can see the electronics. <coughs> there. Um, but all wasn't, all wasn't great. We, um, it, it was hard to build this bad instrument, plus we were having trouble with the European instruments. And uh, in 2002, so two years after we got started, we realized that we were about 20% over budget and we were going to launch a year late. We also had problems with electronic parts, which uh, Henning will remember. <laughs> yes, the plastic parts were not as radiation insensitive as we hoped. They were champions at the radiation detectors. <laughs> yes, that's right. And so we had to change out a huge number of parts. So we, uh, once you get over 20% overrun, you have to go down to NASA headquarters for a cancellation review. That's not fun at all. Um, for a big project like JWST, you know, the top of the org chart is the project manager, but for, for an Explorer mission, it's the principal investigator. So I was pretty much on the hot seat. Make matters worse, as we entered the room, you know, Ed Weiler had just come in. We were sort of, everyone's getting seated. I was huddling with the project manager and the bat manager and Scott, and they were saying, you know, it's going to take us longer to make those, to change out those parts than we thought, even compared to the view graph package we have here. And so I'm thinking, oh my God. And so I had an epiphany. I said, when all else fails, tell the truth. <laughs> and so I just told Ed everything. I said, you know, we've got these parts, we know what to do, but it's not going as fast as we thought. You know, we're going to need this much extra money and then we need extra on that just to have a contingency. And, uh, you know, this is about how he looked through the whole meeting. <laughs> um, that's a good picture of him. And, uh, and then they went off and met with the board of governors, <laughs> the theme directors in those days, and, uh, and left us sitting for an hour. <laughs> sweating, and he came back and he said, okay, we're going to go for it. You guys are so far along, uh, you know, and we're not even going to de-scope the mission. We think the science is fantastic. So it was like, wow. And Al Diaz was our center director at that point. And he really, uh, I had some disagreements with Al over the years, but he very much, uh, very strongly supported SWIFT. And this was before full cost accounting. He said, Okay, Ed, we will cover 10% of the overrun just out of our hides here at Goddard. <laughs> and so, you know, everybody threw in, you can't do that anymore. Or maybe you could, but it's not as openly discussed. <laughs> so we finished the, the mission. I went down to the Cape. I brought my family. It was just a wonderful experience. This is the liquid uh, engines surrounded by three solid rocket boosters. You can turn the liquids on and off and steer them, but once you light the solid nitroglycerin uh, strap-ons, you're going up. And uh, here is our precious payload on top of this bomb. <laughs> That's the way I looked at it. When we went down to Florida, that was the year of the hurricanes. And so we actually had to sit uh, at uh, Cape Canaveral through four hurricanes. I don't think there's ever been that many uh, slashing across Florida. We had to put the whole SWIFT payload back in its shipping container. The panels were torn off the roof of our building. Here was the vehicle assembly building. And uh, so it was a thrilling time, except it was actually a really boring time because there was nothing to do between these hurricanes. And they were predicted there's another one coming. So we had this idea that we would launch right <laughs> through the eye of the hurricane. Because <laughs> there's no wind in the eye. Here's a little bit of footage I'll show you of the launch. 15. 10, 
nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. We have ignition and we have liftoff of NASA's SWIFT spacecraft on a mission to study and understand gamma ray bursts throughout the universe. There's also a funny story about that because after we launched, um, it was a Boeing rocket. So all the Boeing guys, you know, were slapping each other on, their, on the back and, yeah, it was a great success. And they all left the room in great spirits. And we hadn't deployed anything on the observatory yet. And uh, Ed Weiler comes into this story too. He was there at the Cape. And he comes in the morning of the launch. He says, I had this bad dream last night about the solar arrays not deploying. <laughs> Why did he say that? <laughs> so we were all sweating bullets. Of course, the solar arrays deployed just fine. And we got the observatory up, and uh, it's, it's been working beautifully ever since. And it's such a nice uh, mission because it, everywhere we look, we make a multi-wavelength uh, observation. You know, we look in the optical, the UV, the x-rays. You can see how galaxies look so different. Star formation in the UV, basically star glow in the optical. In the X-ray band, you're seeing neutron stars and black holes that are accreting. It looks you know, completely different. But we are up to study transients. And there's so many different kinds of transients. I'm just going to show you a, a, a small smattering since there's just a few minutes left. Uh, gamma ray bursts, of course, but tidal disruption events, stellar flares, uh, novae. Uh, all these different kinds of objects, really learning how the universe works. In the X-ray and gamma ray band, the sky is dominated by transient events. It's completely different than what you see with your eye in the optical band, which looks like a nice, steady, calm universe. Everything's exploding and crashing into each other. And those kind of violent events make high temperatures and you know, make X-rays and gamma rays. Well, the most spectacular of the transients are the gamma ray bursts. And just this is a light curve, just the counting rate from in our bad instrument versus time. This is a sh short burst or ones that are last less than two seconds and long bursts more than two. This is a short burst, but even in this short time, you can see the emission is turning off and on on millisecond time frames. Uh, and you know, it's the brightest thing in the sky. Plus, they're extragalactic, so they're extremely energetic events. One of the things we found with SWIFT is that there's actually two classes of gamma ray bursts. We knew that there were long bursts and short bursts before, but we were able to determine that the short bursts had a different physical origin than the long bursts. Uh, it's kind of like supernova explosions. 1A supernova are a white dwarf that completely explodes and to smithereens. And a type 2 supernova, which looks kind of the same to your eye, is a massive star that collapses. Uh, here, a long burst is due to a massive star collapsing, and the center core forms a black hole, and these jets come out making the gamma ray emission. And for the short burst, we have now pretty strong evidence that it's merging neutron stars. And I'll show you a movie in a minute. They're just orbiting each other. Gravitational waves are draining the system of energy, and eventually they merge in a fiery explosion. They also make a black hole, and they make these jets. And, uh, See, we've observed almost 1,000 bursts. We're going to have a party in a couple of weeks for 1,000, but only 100 short bursts. The short bursts have, take a longer time to explode. The long bursts are massive stars that blow up in a few million years. The short bursts can last up to a billion years, and that binary system drifts out of its galaxy. So we saw these short bursts with HST images outside of the visible light of their galaxy. It's been a huge amount of work. Uh, many people, many theses have been written and review papers. I've got six of these pages. Each one of these is a sh short burst. And we send a signal down to the ground so optical observers and other observers can look at them. And so for each one of them, there's been a campaign of 20 telescopes trying to see the afterglow, uh, observations by Chandra, not in every case, but in many cases, there was a pretty big effort put into trying to figure out what each burst is. When a burst goes off, we get paged. And so you know, our cell phones beep, and we go rushing off to our computers, um, which is a really funny sight when you're at a gamma ray burst meeting and a burst goes off, because suddenly the room is empty. <laughs> and 
And often the speaker is left too, so. Anyway, here's my little, I like to tell, I like to say, we do have really nice numerical simulations of these merging neutron stars. But I think if you want to see what it really looks like, you want to get the artist involved. And so we worked with the uh, art department here. I think this is a really good animation. So here are these two neutron stars orbiting each other. And you have to realize when they get this close, the orbital speed is uh, uh, about 1,000 times a second. So they're churning like a, a blender in your kitchen. Magnetic fields and then fiery explosion, black hole, and the, and the jets. We'll find out if this is true when this ground-based gravitational wave uh, instrument called LIGO gets working. It's just starting to observe right now because these will be really intense gravitational wave signals. And if we see them at the same time that we see, see short bursts over the next few years, we'll know that we really nabbed it. Uh, long bursts, I showed this at the colloquium uh, last <coughs> week. But it's my favorite cartoon. They're bright at all wavelengths, uh, the brightest sources in the sky. Um, if you know optical wave, uh, magnitudes, you know, 18th magnitude, 16th magnitude, they're very basically faint. You can't see them with your naked eye. But these are tens of thousands of times brighter than the galaxies at those distances. And so you can see them much further in the universe than you can, uh, you know, you can see galaxies. When you look with the big optical telescope like the Keck at the afterglow and the optical, you'll see this continuum emission from the gamma ray burst and then all of these spectral lines, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, and we can see what, uh, you know, what the different abundances are of that galaxy out to very high redshifts. These are the most distant objects that are detected by any technique right now. And we're really looking forward when JWST is up to give them triggers and they can look with their deep infrared telescope and really study the galaxy while the burst is going on. I'm going to show you this one, and then I'm going to skip to the end. So this is uh, also an artist's conception of a long burst. It's a massive star. The core collapses. In a supernova, it would collapse to a neutron star, but this collapses to a black hole. It's a rare case. Gas flows onto the black hole and makes these jets that beat out their way out through the star. It's, it's hard to imagine, but it actually happens and uh, makes a gamma ray burst. And uh, also, we only see the gamma ray bursts when they're aimed at us. So there are a lot of gamma ray bursts going off that, that we don't see. I was going to tell you about a lot of other different kinds of science, but I want to skip ahead uh, to the end right now. So we've learned a lot about the gamma ray sky over the la last 20 years. And it's been just so exciting being here at Goddard and being part of that. Goddard is. is kind of the lead institution in, in gamma ray astronomy. And, and you know, it's one of the top ones in many different fields, uh, X-ray astronomy too. This is what the map looked like in 1995 of the sky. We now have 2,000 sources from the Fermi LAD instrument. It's a big version of one of this GRO. Um, Julie McHenry is the project scientist for that. And uh, we have more than 100 pulsars that have been detected. Many of them are radio quiet. We see them only in the gamma ray band. I've turned my, I'm still working on Fermi and, and Swift all every day, I, and it's a great pleasure. But uh, we're looking toward the future as, you know, as everyone in the room is, I'm sure. And so um, we have some uh, innovative new, new technology to do this gamma ray burst field even better and to study gravitational wave explosions. It's called lobster. Uh, it uses a new kind of optic, which gives a wide field capability in the x-ray band, about 100 times more sensitive than the bat. So if, if we can build this thing, it's going to be amazing. We know we can build it. You can buy the pieces. It's really a matter of getting it selected. <laughs> We've tried three times, and we're going to try a fourth. All the countries around, all the astrophysics, you know, space Countries uh, and ESA are trying to get one of these lobster optics flown. So I, th I hope we're the ones that do it. And then there's the WFIRST mission. Uh, I got interested in this through supernova explosions, but it's a, it's a big observatory that will fly after JWST. And it's going to be a huge project here at, <coughs> at Goddard. And here's our science working group that uh, has been meeting over the last five years. 
And my last slide is the future. I just wanted to you know, show the pictures of, of some of the, the postdocs that uh, are working with me and others in the group. I also have, there are a lot of young civil servants uh, in Code 661. And uh, you know, they're, they're so bright and energetic and it's just a pleasure always to, every day to, uh, and, and many of them are here in the room, to work with these people. And it's also a pleasure to have these uh, two girls progeny, uh, my daughter and my son. Uh, my daughter's a physics uh, major, graduate, stu uh, graduate student at Harvard, and my son is a double E who now has a job in Tucson. So it all comes back to roost. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I used too much jargon. No, no, no. Through, throughout your talk, I, I've been trying to understand what gamma rays actually are. And like, are they caused by what's happening to stars? Like whether they implode or explode or, or collide? Can you explain um, why it's important to, to measure them? Right, I should have started with a more basic introduction than that. So, so gamma rays are the shortest wavelength light, you know, beyond X-rays, and they're very penetrating, and they're actually caused in lots of, they're produced in many different mechanisms in astrophysical objects. So one thing is, that, you know, if you have a star exploding or a very hot plasma, then particles are zooming around, and as they move around and are accelerated, they produce gamma rays. And so, when there's a really hot object like an exploding star, you'll see it in gamma rays and in x-rays. And there's some objects where you really can't see it very well in the optical or, or infrared band, and you can only see it in x-rays and gamma rays. So we've, we've learned a lot about the universe when we got telescopes that could observe in those short wavelength bands. But there's other ways to make gamma rays. I mentioned with supernova 1987A, it produces these elements in the center, and they're radioactively unstable. And when they decay, they make gamma rays. And um, if you go into a dentist, or if you have a bone scan, it'll be often with hard x-rays or gamma rays. And those, those can be produced either with a, a little accelerator that's in that device that he's, you know, the dentist puts next to you. Or in some cases, it'll be produced by radioactive elements. And so those are two different ways of making uh, gamma rays. And the thunderstorm sprites produce gammas too. Yes. Lightning produces gamma rays. If we had gamma ray vision, you'd see this bright flash of gamma rays whenever there was a lightning stroke. And uh, we've been looking for gamma ray bursts, but some of our instruments can look down also. So when they fly over a thunderstorm, you'll see, you know, bang, 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 gamma ray signals coming from the thunder's heads as lightning moves upward. Happy to talk to you more if you'd like. <laughs> You were building for a two-year uh, design on SWIFT, and the instrument is, and you used uh, 100,000 COTS parts in it, and we were hoping you'd get to two years. But in fact, it's still running fine, and I haven't heard of any deterioration in your data gathering ability. Right, so Henning's asking about, to propose the Explore program, we had to use low-cost parts, so COTS are commercial off the shelf. Um, and um, we have a lot of them. Basically, none of them have failed. We have lost some of the CAD Zingtel detectors. They get noisy over time, and so we're slowly losing those. But I don't know if you remember, but we have 16 of these BAT modules, and one of them had the non, you know, still had the radiation-sensitive parts. And so we expected that one to fail after about a year. But even that one's still working. Wow. So I think it's a good lesson. You can use these inexpensive parts if you do the right testing and know what you're getting into. We found three out of the 52 part types needed changing. We changed it, and you're working. 
Leo? Are there any secrets to successfully proposing a mission? <laughs> <laughs> I wish I know. I, I didn't give the whole litany here, but I've been on many more unsuccessful proposals. We proposed a mission kind of like SWIFT. It was different, but lost, and the lobster hasn't gotten through in a few tries. Um, well, I guess the one thing that, you know, a lot of people realize, but it has to be the right field at the right time. And so, you know, lately exoplanets have been really sort of a hot topic, and most of the missions that they've been selecting have been in the exoplanet field. But that can swing. So, you know, you don't want to plan on having an exoplanet proposal in five years because it may have changed back to something else. So there's a little bit of luck with that. And uh, I think it's important to have a sort of open policy, tell the community, community about your concept, and partner with university teams if you're here at, uh, at a NASA center to try to get a kind of buzz going in the community about what you're proposing and get them to understand the, the science that you have in mind. Um, it is, go ahead. Was that something that you did differently or better with SWIFT and the first versus all the other mission concepts? I think it was. As I mentioned with SWIFT, it came along at the right time. Everybody wanted to have a gamma ray burst mission. Um, so that was, that was luck, you know, because we were proposing gamma ray burst missions before Beppo Sachs, and they weren't being selected because we thought it was a neat field. Um, and then uh, there was also a little bit of luck, but it was strategic thinking on Nick White's part to look for partners around the world that could contribute some hardware. and so. NASA would get a bigger bang for its buck. It's a double-edged sword, though, because if NASA doesn't trust that partner, it can kill your proposal. And so um, we actually had the head of the Italian Space Agency and of the UK funding agency um, directly contact the selecting officials at NASA when our SWIFT proposal was going in, saying, we will provide this hardware. Trust us. I know there was other times when we didn't deliver, but we will this time. So, um, you uh, you measure radiation from very very long distances, and uh, you showed an artist's impression of what you think is happening. Do you have a way of experimenting here with real physical things that you measure to validate what you are seeing? Most of the validation is done really with big computer simulations, uh, to be honest, as compared to some kind of physical experiment. And, and then another important part of the puzzle, though, is putting together all of the multi-wavelength data, because each, you know, for the observations of this object, this event, because each wavelength band contributes some other different kind of knowledge. And so you put it all together, and then you compare it to the computer model. <laughs> In the ideal case, you have a completely independent way of testing your model, like with these gravitational wave observations. If, if we get that, it'll, you know, it'll really prove that these are merging neutron stars, for example. So it's kind of putting a lot of things together. I'm not su superstitious, but as the gantry was rolling back from the swift, uh, you know, the, the day we were launching, I put a quarter on the rail track. And I've always kept this as my lucky quarter. <laughs> OK, so I was going to ask uh, one final question, but I think we are out of time. I wanted to ask him, uh, Neil, you climbed all these mountain peaks. You won all these major awards. Are you thinking about Himalayas? Are you thinking about the Nobel as well? So, uh, Well, <laughs> not the Nobel, but you want to go with me to the Himalayas? <laughs> I'm always. OK, let's give Neil one more.